What is up you guys and welcome back to my channel and happy new year. We are going into 2022 and this is the first video on my channel of this new year and it is definitely one that I cannot wait to get your opinions on. I feel like a lot of people are going to feel very strongly one way or another on this case so I'm super interested to see what the comment section looks like after this. So today we're going to be speaking about the very strange disappearance of 29 year old Jesse Farber, who was known by Rex, uh, by many of his close friends. And he disappeared from Tamaqua, Pennsylvania on August 11th, 2015. So this case is definitely a few years old. When you go to look it up online, which I suggest a lot of you do, there's not a ton of information out there. And the only reason that I know about this case anyways, is because of the mother of Jesse's children, Rachel. She's reached out to me pretty much every way she possibly can. And she is trying to get Jesse's story out there because she strongly feels along with many family members that there is way more to this strange story than meets the eye. Everyone is pretty much hoping that by talking about Jesse's case, it either will rattle some answers from someone in Tamaqua, Pennsylvania, or possibly can get them in connection with someone that can further help because Jesse has two young children and a huge family that misses him and wants him to come home or at least wants some sort of answers as to what happened to him or where he went. Before I get into the details of this case, I do first need to thank Audible for partnering with me on today's video. As you guys know, I absolutely love Audible. And if you're not familiar with what Audible is, it is the leading provider for spoken word entertainment. And honestly, my very favorite way to consume content. Audible is filled with audiobooks, Audible originals, podcasts. There are sleep tracks, guided meditation, guided fitness, and with so many any genres to choose from, there is something for everyone of all ages. Now, I tend to listen to my audiobooks while I'm doing something else because I have such an issue with wasting any time at all. So when I am driving, I'll listen to audiobooks when I'm working out, when I'm outside with all of my animals. I've even started to get my kids hooked on audiobooks as well. They homeschool, so it's actually very beneficial when we need a little bit of downtime. They can learn something educational thanks to Audible. So I'm currently listening to an audio book that I think you guys would really enjoy, or maybe it's just a passion of mine that I really want everyone to enjoy with me. And that is kind of listening to stories of someone that knew a serial killer and was around them, but didn't know it at the time. I'm always very interested to hear if they picked up on any little clues or, you know, anything gave it away. And that is essentially exactly what the book The Babysitter is by Liza Rodman and Jennifer Jordan. So the entire book goes through Liza's childhood. She unfortunately had a very traumatic childhood, but she had a babysitter who she thought was like one of the most trustworthy men. Her mom worked with this guy at a hotel. He seemed like a really great guy. He always took really good care of her. Um, but unfortunately, decades later, she ended up finding out that this man was actually known as the Cape Cod Vampire. It goes through her whole entire life, how he played a part, and then how she feels now knowing what she does. Now, if this is not something that is up your alley, first of all, I totally understand, but also you have absolutely nothing to worry about because members have access to the all new plus catalog, which contains thousands and thousands of different titles that are simply included in your membership. And on top of that, Audible members get one free credit every single month to go towards a title of their choosing from the premium selection and everything in your library you get to keep forever. If you're interested in checking out Audible, head over to www.audible.com forward slash Danielle or text Danielle to 500 500. Get one free audiobook, a 30 day free trial, and of course, immediate access to the all new plus catalog. A huge, huge thank you to Audible. They have sponsored my channel for years now. They are one of my largest supporters. And that means they've given me an opportunity to even produce this content for you guys, help out these families, and then contribute in whatever way I can to different GoFundMes, towards different efforts, and people searches for their loved ones or just for justice. So now on to the details of this case. So as I said, Jesse was only 29 years old when he vanished from Tamaqua, Pennsylvania on August 11th, 2015, under very strange circumstances. So at the time, Jesse was dating a woman named Rachel and they had two beautiful young children together. Jesse is described as being the most amazing father by everyone that 
knew him. He supported his children more than anything. Rachel remembers that before they had kids, he was very nervous. He wanted to be able to provide for him the best way that he could. Um, and that's exactly what he did. He was there at every single event for his kids. He was always cheering them on in life. Jesse is as loyal as they come, according to Rachel. And he just really loved his friends, really loved his family and led a very laid back life. Jesse is the kind of person that can get along with anyone and everyone. You can throw him into a room with any kind of person and he'll easily be able to become their best friend. He's super chill, super go with the flow and has this way of making everyone around him laugh. And one thing that Jesse loved more than anything was being outside. He loved to hunt, he loved to hike, fish, camp. If it involved being outside, he was absolutely doing it. Rachel said that that was one thing they spent most of their time doing was being in the outdoors. He knew Tamakwa liked the back of his hand, and unfortunately, this also ended up being where he vanished. Just prior to Jesse's disappearance, according to Rachel, some very odd things happened, and his behavior seemed to shift a little bit. So on August 1st, 2015, Jesse and Rachel got into an argument that led to him leaving the home. Um, basically, according to Rachel, this argument was over money. Rachel started noticing large chunks of money vanishing essentially over an extended period of time and they usually would split the bills, but it was getting to the point where she was having to cover portions of Jesse's half. And so she confronted him about this, and this led to a big argument. So at this point, Jesse ended up going to stay with his grandparents, who lived a few miles west of Tamaqua. But by the end of the day, according to Rachel, they both had kind of figured it out. They were gonna move past it, but Jesse still wanted to stay at his grandparents' house. Now, he didn't have any form of his own transportation. He didn't have a car or anything like that. He did have a motorcycle that he was working on to try to get himself from place to place. But for the most part, at the time, he was relying on rides from other people, which wasn't really a huge deal. Um, over the next couple of weeks, Rachel would frequently come over and hang out with him at his grandparents' house. They still took care of the kids together. They would take their son to soccer practice together. So everything was pretty much going on as normal except Jesse wasn't living there, and also Jesse's behavior was a little off. Rachel noticed during this time that he seemed really exhausted. Uh, he seemed worried about something, a little bit nervous. She knew him well enough to know that there was something going on in his head, but every time she tried to get information out of him, he would basically shut it down pretty quickly. By August the 8th, which was the last time that Rachel saw him, she finally decided to really push and try to figure out what was going on. She was crying and upset and basically begging Jesse to give her some sort of information. She told him she, it didn't matter what was going on. He needed to come home. They would figure it out together. But then Jesse said something to her that she said made her really question what was going on. He said, and I quote, I have to do this on my own, but when it's over, we'll all be together again. But unfortunately, Rachel never saw him wasn't sure what it was exactly that he had to do on his own. Um, and pretty much most things from here on out are a total mystery. So on August the 10th, just a few days after Rachel last saw Jesse, he was supposed to get a ride to work from his grandfather. They both worked at, I believe it's Libby's. I am probably pronouncing that wrong. It's either Libby's or Libby's ice cream. He worked at the ice cream plant, which is also just a few miles west of Tamaqua. Um, they both worked there. Rachel worked where you make the ice cream and then Jesse would pallet the ice cream after it was done into the freezer. This was not a far drive drive from his grandparents house. It was actually super quick. Um, and according to Rachel, Jesse had a very unique schedule. He didn't have like a certain time that he had to be at work. He just had to make sure he was at work after the ice cream was done being made to then pallet it and put it into the freezer. But she said typically Jesse would go into work at around 2 p.m. He left his grandparents house with a camo backpack that he usually carried his work overalls and work boots in and he headed off. But at some point in the drive, Jesse told his grandfather father that instead of being taken to work, he wanted to be taken into Tamaqua. And from this point on, pretty much most things that Jesse did are up in the air, but we do know that he never showed up to work that night, which was entirely unlike him. 
So according to what witnesses have said, that day, the 10th of August, around 3 p.m., Jesse was seen alone at a local Burger King that is on Center Street. It is, seems to be the only Burger King in all of Tamaqua, according to what I have been able to find on Google Maps. Um, but he ended up being seen there by Rachel's cousin, Brittany. Sometime later on that day, Jesse also went on to supposedly meet with a young woman named Karina. According to what has been found in Jesse's Facebook messages and what he has told friends, he met Karina for some unknown reason at an undisclosed location and somehow she managed to steal some of his money. I have no idea if anyone ever saw Karina and them together. I do not know if Karina was ever questioned by police. But there are definitely things to corroborate that at some point that day they were in fact together. After meeting with Karina, Jesse ended up meeting up with a few of his childhood friends, one of them being Dustin. And he did this instead of going to work. And as I said, he was a really chill, laid back person, very go with the flow, did what he was supposed to do. He was responsible. He wanted to take care of his children. He never no showed to work until this day. He met with this friend, Dustin. He went to Dustin's house and Dustin lived with his mom, Lori. So she was able to confirm that he was in fact there. Apparently they spent most of the night playing video games, but according to what Dustin has told Rachel, the whole entire night, Jesse seemed very irritated about Karina taking his money. He was messaging Karina's boyfriend, Kyle, back and forth on Facebook, I think trying to resolve the issue. I've seen that Kyle was apologetic and wanted to fix the situation and had listed out a bunch of different places that they could meet face to face to figure out what was going on. Jesse ended up staying the night at Dustin's house and on the day of August 11th, 2015, according to Dustin and Lori, Jesse left sometime between noon and one. And according to Facebook messages between two people that he worked with, he was going to be heading to work. And this makes sense because it's a little bit around an hour walk from kind of central Tamaqua to where he worked at the ice cream plant. But again, he never ended up showing up. And according to other Facebook messages, he did have one planned stop first. Kyle and Jesse had finally settled on meeting at that same Burger King on Central Street in Tamaqua. I guess they were going to finally figure out this theft situation, but according to Kyle, Jesse never showed up. So essentially, Jesse's whereabouts are unknown that day, starting sometime between noon and 1 p.m., until about 9 p.m. that night when he made a very bizarre phone call. And I just want to say Tamaqua is not a huge place by any means. Again, there's like 6,000 residents. It's not tiny, but I feel like for someone to kind of go missing or at least not be seen in that area for such a long period of time is a little bit odd. So that night at 8.43 p.m., Rachel ended up receiving a very frantic phone call from Jesse. Jesse told Rachel that he was being chased by 10 to 11 coyotes, his phone was about to die, and he was up in a tree. He told Rachel that he desperately needed help and that she needed to bring guns and come to get him. According to Rachel, from the moment she picked up the phone, it sounded like Jesse was holding back tears. She said if she could describe the way he sounded, it sounded like he was scared to death. He was literally scared for his life and he just became more panicked as the phone call went on. During this phone call, he changed his location from being behind Tamaqua High School in the woods to being behind the woods of Tamaqua Elementary School. And they're kind of on opposite sides of the town. One's kind of like on the north side of the town, one is on the south side. So those are two entirely different locations. And he finally did end up settling on being behind Tamaqua High School. Now, Rachel begged him to pinpoint his location. They both spent so much time out in these woods. They knew this particular area behind Tamaqua High School really well. Jesse would frequently take the trails along this area that led from Tamaqua to where his work was and to where his grandparents lived. And Rachel said that he could have probably listed off the most random landmark and she would have known exactly where he was. But as soon as she asked him to pinpoint where he was, the phone call ended. 
Rachel called Jesse back multiple times right after this call ended, but obviously either his phone died at this point or was turned off because it just kept going to voicemail. Within minutes, Rachel had managed to wrangle up her little brother, Joey, and they were on the mountain behind Tamaqua High School to look for Jesse. They spent two and a half hours checking with their truck and on foot for any sign of him. Every few feet, they would stop and honk their horn, flash their lights, and then they'd turn the car off to listen and hopefully hear something to know where Jesse was. And this is about a four mile span, but unfortunately this entire area is also a big coal mine. So there's lots of different stripping pits, there's lots of different shafts, air shafts. I mean, the terrain is definitely difficult, um, which made this situation even more horrifying. They searched and searched despite all of their calls. They're sitting and waiting. They're honking. They never were able to locate Jesse. Rachel called the Tamaqua Police Department and told them about this phone call and reported Jesse as missing by sometime around midnight that night. The following day, there was still no sign at all of Jesse and his phone was still going to voicemail. So friends and family hit the ground running to try to locate him. Meanwhile, police were trying to figure out some sort of timeline and a good way to really start the official search, which started on the 13th of August. So at this point, he had been gone for at least 24 hours. Tamaqua Police Department set up a base camp near Rabbit Run Reservoir because of the difficult terrain on Sharp Mountain. You were only able to really access most of it on foot, some of it by ATV. There are areas where the trail is like 30 feet wide and there's other areas on this mountain where you literally have to step one foot in front of the other in order to clear it. The searches on the mountain that day lasted from 11.30 a.m. to 8.30 p.m. and involved numerous different departments, search and rescue teams. Pennsylvania State Police sent a helicopter so they are able to hopefully find some indication of Jesse from above. Multiple dog teams were going up and down the mountain to try to see if maybe they could pick up his scent. Drones were sent to the really hard to reach places to look for Jesse, but by the end of the day, there was absolutely nothing. Thankfully, it seems that the town really had all of the searchers' backs. The Salvation Army came and set up a refreshment center. There were multiple businesses in town that donated whatever they could, including that local Burger King, to try to get these searchers through a really difficult search day. We're talking about hard terrain in the middle of the summer on the East Coast, which if you don't live here, that means high temperatures paired with incredibly high humidity. That is a lot to deal with. By the following day, August 14th, the searches started up again. Many more search and rescue teams joined the Northeast Search and Rescue, firefighters, volunteers, family. And at this point, they also decided to put a camera down into one of the air shafts. So as I said, this was a big mining area. Big Every 100 feet, there is an air shaft, which is essentially, I'll put a picture up here. I don't know if it looks exactly the same on this mountain, but an air shaft is essentially just one big hole drilled into the earth. Sometimes it's 20 feet, sometimes it's 100 feet plus. And they were thinking it was a possibility that maybe Jesse had accidentally fallen into one of these holes. So they tried to put a camera down and one that was one of the deepest ones, but unfortunately something happened. I've heard that it hit a ledge. I've heard that it just got stuck. I've heard that it broke. I'm not sure what it was, but either way, they were never able to get to the bottom of this air shaft. I've also seen that they were taking ping pong balls and throwing them down into these air shafts to see if they could see where it hit the bottom so that maybe they could be able to rule these different holes out. But majority of them went out of sight before ever reaching the bottom. While all of this was going on, family and friends were either helping in the searches, volunteering, or they were passing out flyers in hopes that someone may have seen Jesse that night that could lead authorities in a solid direction because their entire search so far was based off of what he had told Rachel, but he had also mentioned the elementary school. He did in fact settle on the high school, but you know, it was really kind of guesswork. 
they did finally decide to ping Jesse's phone and it did lead them to Sharp Mountain, that rough location. By August 15th, the following day, it was the third day of the search and even more search and rescue parties joined in on the efforts, the rescue squad, fire police, Pennsylvania Wilderness Search and Rescue. But despite using everyone who would possibly come out to help look for Jesse, they still found nothing. So by the end of that day, Tamaqua Police Department decided to end the official search. The family was devastated because they knew just how many stripping pits were out there, how many air shafts, and knowing that it was pretty much impossible to search every single one and rule them out gave them nightmares. I know that Rachel said that she knew that no teams had gone down into any of the stripping pits. The Tamaqua Police Department said that they just didn't have the resources to do that. It's slippery, it's dangerous, um, and she decided to go down on her own and check some of them with her brother because she could not bear the thought that he might be down in one of them and nobody searched it. The largest theory by police at this point was that Jesse had at some point decided to come down from a tree. I mean, they'd taken drones out there, searched on foot, there were helicopters, he didn't stay in a tree or they likely would have found him. So they believe he came down when the coast was maybe somewhat clear and took off running west in the dark. Despite Jesse knowing the area very, very well, trying to navigate it in the dark while being very scared, it's very possible this led to a misstep and he did in fact end up in one of these holes. They even considered the idea that maybe Jesse was actually experiencing a drug-induced hallucination. Maybe he believed he was being chased by coyotes, but that wasn't actually what was happening. But ultimately, no matter which way it went, with air chefs being every 100 feet, the chance of him falling in was very high. From my understanding, Tamako Police Department did try to question as many people as they could, people that were with him that day or just knew him. They also ended up receiving a tip from, I believe, a childhood friend of his. They claimed that they saw Jesse that night. It was 7.20 p.m. the night of the 11th, so now we have this kind of sighting towards the end of the night, and they saw Jesse walking on Hunter Street. This is a way that would have been taken to and from the trails that would have gone through Sharp Mountain into Tamaqua or, you know, vice versa. According to police, the time that this witness saw him there matched up with where he would have ended up when he made the phone call. So while Tamako Police Department was convinced that Jesse was actually either chased by a wild pack of coyotes or he hallucinated that he was chased by a pack of coyotes until he fell into one of the many holes in Sharp Mountain, friends and family believed there's actually way more to this. There were rumors that were spreading around Tamaqua that Jesse was not talking about actual coyotes as in the animals, but as in a street gang that he allegedly owed money to. Now, this rumor spread through tons of people in town. A lot of people were claiming that Jesse was shot, put in a wood chipper. I mean, so many awful gut-wrenching things were said that could have possibly happened to Jesse. And all of this information was brought forward to authorities. Because this was very alarming. And when you really look back and think about his behavior for the couple of weeks prior to his disappearance and the fact that the argument between him and Rachel was about money and um, you know, he didn't show up to work two days in a row. There were just some very weird things that were going on that didn't add up that really suggested there was something he was worried about or there was just something that was going on. Now, police came back and said that they couldn't find any evidence at all that this was a possibility. They said they had heard the rumors themselves. So this, again, was something that was going around town pretty heavily, but that they had no idea of a gang called the Coyotes. They weren't able to find anything to suggest there was someone that was going after Jesse. And they also said that a gang like that isn't going to have followed Jesse up the mountain and done something to him. Uh, they said that just seemed kind of like a far stretch. But the way I look at it, if he was walking by himself at sunset, basically going out of town to where it's a lot more remote, I think that kind of is the place that makes the most sense for someone to follow him. According to what Rachel has told me, she started really digging in deep and asking questions. When there were rumors that were spreading, she would track down the people that you know were either spoken about as being involved, 
or had said the rumor themselves and confronted them about what was going on. And she quickly began to realize that pretty much nobody in the town wanted to talk about Jesse, which was definitely unsettling. And then she found out even more things that just didn't sound like Jesse. So according to Rachel, when police finally got a hold of Jesse's phone records, Jesse had spoken to his brother that night at about 6 p.m. I have absolutely no idea what he spoke to his brother about or if police were able to speak to his brother to figure out what they spoke about, but that's someone that he had a four minute conversation with. I would love to know what his mindset was at the time, but also around this time, Jesse repeatedly made calls to his bank. He was calling into his bank account to figure out what his balance was. According to Rachel, since they both worked at the ice cream plant together, he got paid that following Friday and he knew that. Wasn't expecting any payments unless there was someone else that he was waiting to deposit money into his account. Or she theorizes it's possible he maybe was being asked about a debt he owed and he was trying to buy himself time. Also, she managed to find out through the phone records that he had been with Dustin that night. At this point, she wasn't aware of that information and was able to go to Dustin and talk to him. This is when Dustin spoke to her about this money being taken, but also Dustin told her that Jesse, someone who wasn't known for drugs, went and bought meth the night of the 10th. According to Rachel, again, this is something entirely unlike Jesse. Jesse did not use drugs while they were together. She said that he probably was scared out of his mind when he went and bought this, but it really makes you question what is going on. This opened up a couple of different doors, finding out a lot of this information. Obviously, this puts a lot more weight into the idea that Jesse may have been experiencing some sort of drug-induced hallucination. When you look at the chunks of money that were missing um, and you look at him, you know, not going to work, really makes you wonder if maybe he had picked up a drug habit and maybe he was calling his bank account repeatedly in desperation, hoping some money would pop up so he could buy himself some more drugs. Now, I don't know how plausible this is because Rachel has said that when they lived together, she knew for a fact he wasn't using. Um, but I really wonder if this may have had something to do with it. Was he just spiraling and going through something mentally? He ended up hallucinating about these coyotes and accidentally falling into a hole. Now, while this does put kind of weight into this idea and it does make a lot of things make sense, his mom does not believe this is at all the case. According to Rachel, other than being upset, I don't think it seemed at all like he was using drugs or on drugs at the time of the phone call. And his mom made a really good point as well that if he was hallucinating and in such a panicked state of mind, she doesn't know how likely it is that he would have been thinking well enough to call Rachel and ask for help and also be able to pinpoint his location. But this also makes me question a whole lot of things. Where was Jesse between leaving Dustin's home at noon to 1 p.m. on August 11th to when he was seen walking by this witness at 720? Like I said, Tamak was a very small town and I don't know if police ever checked the surveillance footage around town or questioned any business owners around town to see if maybe Jesse was hanging out around there the whole entire day. Has anyone come forward and said that they were hanging out with him that time of day? I just find it so strange that he was unaccounted for in this big chunk of time and not a single person has come forward to say that they were with him. Another thing that really kind of, to me, throws a wrench in this idea that he was trying to get money to buy more drugs and was just dealing with addiction is if so, he would have showed up to speak with Kyle that night. It seemed like Kyle was going to give the money back that Karina had stolen from him. I mean, according to the messages, this was going to be resolved if he was so worried about his money and wanted this money back so bad and this all just had to do with addiction, I feel like he would have shown up. And the fact that he didn't makes me wonder why. I feel like so many answers in this case are hidden in that time period that Jesse is unaccounted for. Apparently shortly after his disappearance as well, there was a backpack that was found by Rachel's family by the elementary school. So when they were on this phone call, he kept bouncing from the high school to the elementary school, which again are on separate sides of town, north and south. So my assumption is that her family was thinking, you know, maybe we are looking in the wrong place and he really was behind the elementary school. So 
They went and looked, and from what Rachel has said, they did find some sort of backpack. However, this backpack is not mentioned in the news. I don't think, according to Rachel, authorities don't have it. So I have no idea if this did in fact belong to Jesse. I just know that there is someone out there who claims that his ID was in it. Interestingly enough, in December of, I believe, 2016, or it might have actually been 2015, just a few months after he disappeared. I can't quite get the year right there, uh, but an important discovery ended up being made. Apparently, a hunter was in the woods on Sharp Mountain, and this was about a mile and a half away from where they really focused their search for Jesse initially. And this hunter was going in for the day and looked off in the distance and saw a pair of sweatpants hanging from a tree. And Jesse had last been seen in a pair of sweatpants. So he initially is not thinking about Jesse. He's like, oh, here we go again. You know, there's plenty of hunters that come out here, um, people riding their ATVs, campers. They probably just littered. So he wanted to go and get the sweatpants down and throw them away. But when he got closer, he noticed that one of the legs of the sweatpants had been tied in a knot and a rock had been put in there. And if anyone knows anything about that sort of setup, usually things like that are used as a weapon. Then he looked a little bit further up in the tree and noticed that there was a book bag up there as well. According to what I've seen some articles state, this was confirmed, in fact, to be Jesse's book bag. Apparently, it has been said that there was a pin on the book bag that Jesse's grandfather had given him, and that is the way that it was identified. I think there was like a sweatshirt in there, um, boots, a phone charger maybe. I don't know the exact items that were in the bag, and it apparently matched the description of the bag. But according to Rachel, she does not believe this was actually his bag because the pen that was allegedly used to identify it is in the possession of her son literally right now. Now, this is where a lot of questionable things are brought up. So it is strongly believed by both Rachel and Jesse's mother that this bag and these items were possibly planted at this location in this tree. We have this other bag that is found that matches the description of Jesse's bag. We have the second bag found at the other location Jesse said he was at. The way it was identified is questionable. And also the place that this bag and these sweatpants were found is so strange. It took Rachel about an hour to get to this tree, according to what she told me. You have to go down a few very deep ditches. There is like this rock wall you quite literally have to scale. There is this silt um, ledge you have to shimmy yourself up. The area right before the tree is one of those places where you have to put one foot in front of the other or you fall either way very far down into one of these stripping pits. I'm talking like probably hundreds of feet. It's a sketchy area and the tree itself is apparently a super skinny, brittle tree. And none of this adds up to being chased by coyotes. If you were being chased by coyotes in this area, you wouldn't have had time to scale a rock wall, shimmy on your hands and knees up this little silt embankment. I mean, that is an area and terrain that it took her an hour to get through. Granted, maybe he had already climbed half of it when he was being chased by coyotes. But if it was that hard for a person to get up there, I can imagine it was probably also a little difficult for a whole pack of 10 to 11 coyotes to be up there as well. Add to that, Rachel said that when she was on this phone call with Jesse, his voice was the only thing on the other end of the line. It was silence other than that. Now, I live in the middle of absolute nowhere in the country of North Carolina. And when I tell you coyotes are an everyday experience for me living where I live, I mean it. And you know First of all, if coyotes are nearby because they let out this like bone chilling <laughs> hair on the back of your neck standing up like cackling screech. I don't even know how to describe their call. When they're after something or chasing something, they are making a ton of noise and you can hear it from forever away. Any dogs in the area are barking. I mean, it is like a whole ordeal when they run through. So I feel like if coyotes were in fact chasing him, it's more likely that 
they would have been heard, then things be completely silent on the other end. I also was super interested because I'm very familiar with coyotes and I live in an area where they are heavily prevalent. I wanted to look up statistics on coyotes attacking people, you know, for my own sake, and also to understand how possible it would be that he was being chased by coyotes and potentially attacked by them because there was no sign in any of the searches of blood or torn up clothing. They're not gonna take all of that with them. There would have been clothes, there would have been blood, there would have been bones, there would have been something somewhere in the nearby area had these coyotes been successful. But when I looked up statistics, there are 367 documented attacks on humans by coyotes between the years of 1977 and 2015. Only 367 and 165 of those occur in California, which is on the opposite coast. So it is not very common at all for a coyote to attack a human, which again, I feel like was very questionable to me from the get-go because if coyotes even hear me talking or turn a light on or making noise, like that's how we get them to go away on my farm is by making noise and like being a human. They don't like it, they run away. And then I looked up more statistics and there are only two recorded incidences ever of humans being killed by coyotes in all of the United States and Canada in all of time. So, I was really shocked hearing these statistics because I feel like authorities very quickly kind of jumped onto, oh, he was being chased by coyotes, this is normal, and they just went with it. And so I kept saying, you know, is this something that they've seen before? Like, is this very common and I just don't know about it? Uh, but as you can see, it's not very common at all. There are very strong feelings here. The police strongly believe he either was in fact one of the rare cases where coyotes chased a person and potentially killed them, and it somehow left absolutely no trace behind on a ridiculously difficult to get to area at the top of a peak between two stripping uh, pits, or possibly he used drugs and hallucinated this, which maybe that's a possibility. He did in fact buy drugs the night before, was he high? Was he freaking out? And did that lead to him ending up getting in an accident? Possibly. But according to his friends and family, all of the rumors that are going around town, threats have been made to the family for asking questions. People won't speak about him. They just have this gut feeling like there is something more to this and they want authorities to dig deeper. Now, I know that authorities did in fact do another search once this book bag and pair of sweatpants was found. They were not able to find anything in that particular area, again, leading them to believe he was attacked by anything. They also have stated that they're not entirely ruling out this idea that he was in fact attacked by a gang of coyotes and not like a pack of coyotes. Smokko police have said that when different individuals have been arrested for drugs. They have in fact thrown in the question about Jesse Farber in there. I know that in 2016, there was also a pretty large raid where over 20 people were arrested in connection with drugs. And they, from my understanding, were offered a get out of jail free card if they had any information they could hand over about Jesse, but none of them took the bait. I personally don't know what to believe in this situation. From my understanding, authorities are not really searching for him any longer. It is still an active investigation, but they say there's just not anything else they can do. I do know that Rachel and a few other family members have in fact tried to go to the state police for more help. They've gone to the DA to try to ask for help to the FBI. But every single response is that they can't do anything unless Tamaqua police invite them in. And it doesn't seem Tamaqua police have any interest in doing that. I personally think that's unfortunate because if there is such a high chance, according to Tamaqua police, that he could be in one of those holes, I feel like bringing in a higher power with more with more resources may help. It might find him and bring him home. At least finding him will give his family a little bit of closure, but instead they're left with no answers. They are left with rumors that are still spreading around town. They are left being threatened every time they question everything and just this awful feeling of Jesse might be up on the mountain and we might not ever find him. There was initially a reward when the first few searches were ongoing, but I do not believe there is a reward 
for any information on Jesse at this point in time. Um, I'm really hoping that in the near future, either Rachel or Jesse's family will start up a GoFundMe so that people can possibly donate to hiring a PI or um, possibly reward money. Because I feel like if someone just looked kind of further into everything, it might give a little bit more clarity to the situation. But there's just a lot of sketchy things that really make me believe that this was not just an accident. This was not just Jesse decided to use drugs and hallucinated. There was a copy of phone records handed over to police where some phone calls had been deleted. I mean, there have been things that have been purposely done in this case to cover up communications between Jesse and people the night that he disappeared. But I just feel like Jesse's case did not get the amount of tension it deserves. And I feel like it deserves another look. It deserves a pair of fresh eyes looking onto it. It deserves someone helping Jesse's family who have essentially had to go about everything on their own at this point. Um, he's got children, he's got people that love him that they just want answers. My ultimate hope in all of this is that this either rattles someone in the town to maybe say something. Maybe this is weighing on someone's conscience. Maybe someone has had to have information in their mind at all times since Jesse disappeared. And now that it's been a few years, they feel comfortable coming forward and saying something about it. Or maybe you guys will be able to get this in the hands of someone that can help this family, a PI that will do things pro bono, um, a possible resource that could help search these holes. On that note, I'm going to go ahead and go, you guys, please let me know what you think down below. I feel like all of these different avenues are very highly possible. And I feel like maybe the coincidences of some of them being around the same relative time could just be just that coincidences, something that is totally unrelated, but just makes things that much more confusing. On that note, I'm going to go ahead and go you guys. If you haven't already hit the subscribe button down below, go ahead and do so so you can become a part of the Howland fam so that we can hopefully bring them home together or bring them justice together. And I will see you guys in my next video. Bye.